<clears throat> excuse me, Acts chapter 27. And I forgot to turn that on back. Then. I'll just leave that there. All right, Acts chapter 27 and verse 35. The Bible says, And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. The title of the message today is this, giving, or I'm sorry, thankful. Or you could say giving thanks. That's what popped in my mind right there. But giving thanks or being thankful in the storm and in the shelter. In the storm and in the shelter. Now, what do I mean? What am I talking about here? By in the storm and in the shelter. Well, let's go back to chapter 26. Acts chapter, well, let's even go back to chapter 25. Go back to chapter 25 and verse 11. And this is where this story picks up. Now, the Jewish people did not like the um, preaching of Paul. Um, John, would you go back and turn on the, 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 the PA? I need to have that. My voice has messed up on me this morning. You can turn both of those on, the mics and the sound thing. <clears throat> you get it? Let me just get it. Get it both? Okay, cool, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. All right, very good. Boy, my voice just gave out on me this morning. I had a cough drop in my mouth while we were doing the singing and it just uh, just got me and so I'm struggling with my voice so pray for my voice um, now but anyway chapter 25 look at verse number 11 Paul by the way Paul had been arrested by the Jewish people and um, was on trial they were accusing him of all kinds of blasphemy and different things like this well Paul being a Roman citizen Paul said he would just appeal unto Caesar that's what we're going to see here in Acts 25 and verse 11 he says for if I be an offender or have committed anything wrong, worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof they accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. Here it is now. I appeal unto Caesar. Now a Roman citizen could say, I appeal unto Caesar, and then that meant their case would be taken to Rome. And so that's what now happens. Notice verse number 12. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. Then look at chapter 26 and verse 32. Acts chapter 26 and verse 32. The Bible says, Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. So he had appealed unto Caesar, and so now the determination was made, okay, you have to go to Rome. Now we come to chapter 27 and verse 1. The Bible says, and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. And entering into a ship of Adria um, Mitum, um, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, um, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon. And Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us Therein. So I just want you to kind of get an idea of what's going on. They've got to get Paul to, to Italy. And so here is this centurion. He's got other soldiers, or other prisoners, I should say. He has some soldiers with him, but he's got these other prisoners. And they've got to transport them to Rome. Now, clearly, Paul is not a dangerous criminal because he allowed Paul to go and to be with his friends and to refresh himself. So he knew Paul was not a danger to society. Well, now they get on this other ship that also is sailing into Italy. Verse 7. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against um, Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete and over, over against so, um, Salmone. 
And hardly passing it came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens. Nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. And when much time was spent, now I want you to see this now, much time was spent. And when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Now, I want to talk about this for just a minute before we go on, so you make sure you get this, this, this setting here. They came unto the city of Lycia. Much time was now spent. So there was something that had delayed them for a while. Again, they're on their way to Italy. Now, let me show you something else they're in a hurry for. Notice, skip on down to verse number 12. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also. So they were in this haven called the fair haven. And winter was drawing nigh. And they looked at this and they said, this is not a good place for us to spend the winter. Now, I don't know what would have been different. They didn't go into detail about it. Maybe there was not the supplies. There may not have been places for them to stay. You know, when you've got a centurion, well, he has a hundred soldiers. And then you have all of these prisoners, then plus everybody else, whoever might be on the ship as far as helping to sail it and all the workers on and that. And they arrive there and they realize there's not enough place. There, there's not enough hotel rooms, whatever you want to call it there, you know, places there where they're able to stay. They said, this is not a place where we need to stay for the winter. But yet they had stayed several days there. And now when it's time to go, Paul says, we don't need to make this trip. If we make this trip, it's going to be very dangerous. Now, the Bible tells us, we saw there in verse number nine, that the fast was now already passed. So here's the question. What fast is this? What is, what is this time, this, this period here? Now, when you look in your Bible commentaries, because I looked up the Bible commentaries, here's what they all say. They all say it was the day of atonement. Now, this is why you have to remember Bible commentary people that are writing, many times they take guesses just as well as anybody else. Just because you read it in a commentary doesn't mean that it's on the same authority as the Bible. There's a, I run into this a lot of times with people that they'll say, but Dr. So-and-so in his book said this. Fine. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Okay, he's got his opinion on it, but that doesn't mean that it necessarily matches up with the Bible. Let's see what the Bible says about something. The Bible tells us that winter was almost nigh. Now, when's the Day of Atonement? That's Yom Kippur. Well, this year it was September 25th. Every year it's at the end of September, maybe the first of October. It's around like, that's not close to winter. So again, if these Bible commentary people had just read a couple verses down and saw that it was winter, they would have known that the fast was not talking about the Day of Atonement. Plus, why would a Roman centurion and all of his soldiers observed the fast. Why would they then say, okay, we're not gonna travel because it's time for Paul to have his fast and his day of atonement. Plus, the day of atonement was a day. It wasn't a many days, drawn out many days. So then you get to thinking, okay, well, what was it? What was this time period of where they arrived and they all just stopped? Well. I encourage you to even look some of this up later. Again, uh, there's nothing wrong with doing research. I did research myself on it, and this is what I think that it was. I think it was a festival that was called Saturnalia. Yes, just like the planet Saturn. Saturnalia. I believe that that was what was taking place at this time. Now, why, uh, why do I think that? This takes place in the middle to the end of December, the middle to end of December. This was, again, all you have to do is look up ancient Roman festivals or ancient Roman holidays, and boy, you'll find all kinds of stuff telling them. Many of these ancient Roman festivals and holidays were one day. It didn't last several days. But this Saturnalia was 12 
days. Do you see where this is going? A Roman festival right to the middle, to the end of December that lasted 12 days. See, it was from that that then later it became the 12 days of Christmas. Understand that a lot of what happened here with the Saturnalia, a lot of these things that were taking place are a lot of the traditions that have been carried over into our holiday of Christmas. Now, I talked about this in Sunday school. You don't let someone who's offended by a day stop you from observing a day you want to observe. That's the liberty we've been given in Christ. If someone is offended by the day of Christmas, well, fine, don't observe Christmas. You have to do what you know you feel is right in before God. But at the same time, for me, I'm not observing some Roman festival. I'm not worshiping the god Saturn. I'm not doing something that's uh, against scripture. I am remembering the time when Jesus came to earth and was born to be my savior. And so that's what I'm observing when I am observing Christmas. And again, like I said, we read the verse there in, the, um, in Sunday school. We talked about that. I don't want to preach that over again. If you want to listen to it, um, hear the Sunday school lesson there about those days. Because again, Thanksgiving, there's a lot of pagan holidays celebrating the end of the harvest. I'm still going to observe Thanksgiving because I'm not rejoicing and celebrating in their pagan holidays of the end of harvest. Um, the same with Halloween. Now, I don't observe Halloween as far as the witches and, and, and the scary things and all that that, 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 that that try to do that there for Halloween. But again, at the same time, if you want to at the end of uh, uh, October and, and you want to go to a pumpkin patch or you want to go to a corn maze or you want to... Um, have a pumpkin spice latte or you want to have, um, you know, something smelling like that. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, we're not celebrating the evil that they are celebrating. We have our own things, what we are observing. But Christmas, a lot of these things, it came from this Roman time period, this Roman holiday. Saturnalia, this would take several days. Listen to this. It was an ancient Roman holiday in, um, in honor of the god Saturn, beginning on the 17th of December of the Julian calendar. The holiday was celebrated with a sacrifice at the temple of Saturn in the Roman forum and a public banquet, followed by private gift giving, continual partying, and a carnival atmosphere that overturned Roman social norms. Gambling was permitted, and masters provided table service for their slaves as it was seen as a time of liberty for both slaves and freedmen alike. A common custom was the election of a king of Saturnalia who gave orders to people which were followed and presided over the merrymaking. The gifts exchanged were usually gag gifts and small figurines made of wax or pottery known as um, sigillaria. Um, the poet Catalyst called it the best of days. So I want you to picture now here's this Roman centurion and his soldiers and they're traveling and they arrive there at this, at this fair havens and now it's time for this celebration. Now I will say this, at this point in time with Paul, there was no Christmas as we know it. So you know what? I believe this is what is, is, is being taught right here in this passage. I believe that Paul fasted while they were partying. Paul saw the worship of the false gods. Paul saw all of the wickedness and the evil that was taking place during this Roman festival and also tied in with the winter solstice. All of these things that were there, and again, there would even be parts from the Greek culture which the Romans had adopted. And, and, and I believe Paul saw all this was taking place and Paul said, I'll show you that I'm not partaking in any of this during your time of your festivity, I'm going to fast. And I believe that's what Paul is, is referring to and mentioning here. Because then you know, you see how it mentioned there in verse number 12, um, there of how the, the winter was coming on. Now, do this real quick. Look over at chapter 28. Look over to chapter 28 and verse number 11. We'll get up to this point here in just a minute. But look at chapter 28 and verse 11. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. So they stayed on this island for three months, this island where they later were shipwrecked. They didn't stay at the Fair Havens, and they then were shipwrecked, and they stayed there for three months. So that brings it perfect then. 
January, February, March, when the when it's really cold, the winter, the snow is blowing, ice, more ice than normal, even out there in the water, icebergs, whatever it might be that would be the danger. So they wintered for three months, and then from there, they then made their way to Italy. All right, so I want you to get a picture here. And by the way, in the story as well, we're going to read and we'll see about, well, I'm going to put it this way. I'm not going to have time to read all of this chapter 27. You're going to have to, to go home and read this, but you'll read that it was very cold. And so they made a fire. By the way, let me tell you what happens. They, the south wind blew softly. So they got into the boat and they left from the Fair Havens. And as they went, then all of a sudden they caught into, got caught up into a storm. They went 14 days in this storm. 14 days. And the people did not eat during the 14 days. They were fasting in that boat. Now, again, that goes, the fasting goes back to a lot of the cultures of the day and a lot of people had the mindset and the idea not even i'm not talking about people that worship god people that have false gods they still had the idea and the mindset that if you fasted that was how you got in touch with your god and so when they're fasting on this boat they're in touch with their god trying to get in touch with their god and they're not getting any answer from their god after 14 days this is when paul now stands up and that was our text verse that we read at verse 35 now, I want you to keep this in mind. Here's the people. They are uh, terrified. They believe they're going to die. None of their gods are answering. They've been fasting for these 14 days on the boat uh, since they've been in the storm. They've been fasting these 14 days. And Paul finally stands up and he says, listen, I want you to take some bread and eat it. You've been fasting 14 days. You know what Paul's getting them to do? They are turning from their gods. They're turning from their fast. Because they would have to know, Paul, we're fasting to our God. Our God's going to answer. But now when Paul is standing up and he says, listen, I'm telling you, my God has stood by me. My God has told me what's going to happen. I want you to take some bread and eat. What were they doing? They were breaking the fast to their gods. And now they were saying, all right, let's trust Paul's God and see if his God is going to answer so Paul stands up in front of all of them and he prays, he breaks the bread, he eats it, he hands it to them as well. And Paul tells them, do not escape the ship because some had tried to escape. He says, you've got to stay here in the boat. And then whenever the storm of the ship then got stuck, Paul said, all right, now that we're stuck here at the land, we're close to the land. If you can swim, swim. If not, you get on pieces of the boat that have been broken off. And you know what the Bible says? Every single person made it to land just as God had promised, just as Paul had prophesied. Now, when they arrived there on the land and we come into chapter 28 there, we can see this island called Melita. And there were barbarous people. And again, the barbarous people just meant that they didn't have the culture of the Romans. Um, and so they would look at them and say, oh, they're barbarous because of the way they live. But yeah, they showed them kindness. And notice the Bible says they kindled a fire because of the cold. So here it is, you can just picture towards the end of December now, you're getting there, what we would, you know, again, 25th, something like that, towards the end of December. It's very cold, and they've been wet, and they come to the island, and now they build this fire, and all the people are there. And Paul is helping to gather firewood and to put it on the fire. And as he picks up the firewood, then a, a serpent comes out of the fire, and it bites Paul. And the barbarous people there on the island, they saw him, they said, oh, this man, he did something really bad. And the gods are going to kill him. He's, he was supposed to die out of the water and he didn't die. And now he's going to die here. You know what Paul did? Paul just shook it off into the fire. And then nothing was wrong with him. And you know what they then said? This man's a god. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not a god either. So you know what happens now? Paul has all of these people that were on the ship now believing in his God. And now he has all these people on this island now believing in his God, in Jehovah God, the only true God. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love, love this story. I wish we had time to, to sit and read all of this as well. And then there was a man that Paul healed on the island in verses seven and eight. You can read this as well. Um, and, and there were others who came and they were healed. And of course they showed them many honors. You can just imagine for three months, as they're there on this island and Paul has an opportunity to preach the gospel to every single one of these people. Now they leave from that island and they're sailing and they now arrive in Italy. Let's continue reading now. Look at verse 12. 
Acts 28 and verse 12. And landing at Syrac Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day in the south wind blew, we came the next day to um, Huti um, Oli, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. So we went toward Rome. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as a by forum and the three taverns. Now, Paul is not at a bar. When we hear the word tavern, immediately we think of bar in our country here. A tavern was a, a hotel, it was a, a shelter place. So there were three, um, three havens. In other words, there were three different places where a person could stay at, three different resting places. Um, some towns will have what they call it a hotel street or a hotel circle. Maybe there's a, a cul-de-sac and several hotels in there or whatever. And so this place was known as the three taverns. There were three different places where people could stay. They arrived there and these other believers come and meet Paul there at the taverns. I knew if I said the title of my message is Thankful in the Taverns, then people would see the title and take that the wrong way. So I knew I couldn't have my title be Thankful at the Taverns. But anyway, so that's why I said it's being thankful in the storm and in the shelter. You see Paul in the storm, in the ship, took bread and thanked God. And now what do we see? Here's Paul. He's on dry land. It's warming up now. It's a beautiful spring day. They're at these beautiful place where they could stay in these three taverns. You know, it was a, a tourist place, you could say, a, a resort place, a nice place, eight by forum, and the three taverns. And when Paul saw the brethren, he thanked God and took courage. And then the next verse says, and when we came to Rome, so this, this whole story has been taken since Paul said, I appeal to Caesar and then till they make it there to Rome. Now, I want you to turn real quick over to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 because this verse is going to tie in with our message here today. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 6. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. The Bible says, be careful for nothing. In other words, don't worry. Don't worry. Be careful for nothing. Now get, listen to this next part. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, notice this, with thanksgiving. In everything, pray with thanksgiving. That's what he's saying here. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We are to be thankful in Everything. Notice that the wording there. In everything. Now I got another verse I want you to see. Look at First Thessalonians chapter five and verse eighteen. Turn to First Thessalonians chapter five and verse eighteen, and we're going to see similar wording. First Thessalonians five eighteen. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know what God wants of you? What God's will is for your life? Well, there's many things, but one thing is for you to give thanks. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning, that the wicked do not give thanks. And if we allow sin to come into our heart, we will not be thankful people. We need to uh, um, be thankful. It should be a Christian character trait of ours of being thankful in every thing. Who wrote this in both those passages? Paul. Think about this. Paul says in everything, in a storm, he still found something to be thankful for. If you come outside and you see that your tire's flat, it's hard to then say, whoa, thank you, Lord, for the flat tire. No, I mean, we're frustrated. We know we got this to do and that to do, and, and then that's going to cost more money, and, and it's hard to say thank you for that. But in the midst of getting that tire changed, don't forget to be thankful. God might send somebody over to help you and they change your tire. Be nice to that person and tell them, thank you. You go to a place to get it repaired and they fix that thing. Be sure to tell them, thank you. Don't forget to be thankful even when things are going bad. In everything, give 
things. It's hard to thank God when they say, oh, you've got to go to the hospital. Well, yes, I'm going to the hospital. Thank you, Lord. I'm going. No, but while you're in the hospital, be thankful. You can be thankful to the nurses that come and, and help you. You can be thankful for the people who bring the food. You can be thankful. You can tell people thank you. In everything, give thanks. We're going to find ourselves in situations that are not very pleasant. Don't forget to be thankful in those situations. Paul could have just eaten the bread quietly by himself and everybody else is fasting and all that and Paul's back there and he goes, well, 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 you just get away. But no, Paul made it public. He wanted everybody to know, I am thanking God even in the midst of this storm. Now, in closing, I've got three things that are going to help us to be thankful in everything. Every bad situation, whatever, and even every good situation. <laughs> be thankful even in the good situations. Three things are going to help us to be thankful. Number one is a habit. A habit. Parents teach their children. So now say thank you. They start at an early age. Now say thank you. What are you supposed to say? Thank you. We teach that to children at an early age. I was this morning talking with my wife and I said, thinking on this message here, I've had this song running through my head from when we were with our kids as little. Um, and, and some of you might know this song as well. It's a very good little song please and thank you. They're called the magic words. You know what I'm talking about? You know the song? You hear the song? <laughs> if you want nice things to happen, they're the words that should be heard. Well, anyway, I'll stop with that. <laughs> if you do know it, it gets stuck in your head. <laughs> I don't want to have that thing running through my head of all the days. You teach kids at an early age. Say thank you. Say thank you. Thank you. We need to form a habit of saying thank you. You find yourself when you're at the grocery store. The person behind the register is getting paid to be there. And not only that, the manager is overcharging you for what you're buying. I'm just kidding. But it feels like that sometimes. And so you pay money and you're complaining the whole time you're paying the money. This costs too much. This costs too much. This costs too much. And then the cashier, they take your money and they hand you back your change in the receipt. And what do we say? Thank you. <laughs> Why am I thinking that person? They're doing their job. But that's, that's good. We need to be in the habit of saying thank you. Thank you in everything. We need to form that habit. Um, sad to say, you spend much time over at the nursing home and you're gonna find people that are not very thankful. <laughs> sad to say, I, where's my coffee? I don't have any coffee, I didn't get any coffee. Well, you could say, can I please have some coffee? And then when I bring it, thank you. But no, it's, where's my coffee? I don't have coffee. Now, okay, how does a person get like that? Well, you back up. When, the, when they were a young adult and their kids were at home, it was not please and thank you. Clean your room. Hang out of the trash. And it was just constant. Go do it, go do it. There wasn't please and thank you. And then the kids leave the house. My wife and I are in this stage now. And you gotta be careful. Because then you can turn all that towards your husband or towards your wife. Bring me a Diet Coke. Bring me coffee. Take out the trash. Make the bed. You can be careful to where then you're demanding of your spouse. Become demanding of them. And you're not saying please and thank you. And then next thing you know, you're in the manor. You're in the nursing home. And it's a habit that you've been forming all of your life. Of bring me this. About time. What took you so long? Well, how did a person get like that? They've been doing that for years. We need to form the habit of please and thank you. Make it a habit to where it's just natural. To where that one day when we are there in the nursing home and our mind is not the way it used to be, it's just part of our nature. People say, wow, what a pleasant person because they made a habit saying thank you. So how can you be thankful in everything? First off, just make it a habit. Just be in a habit of saying thank you. And then even when things are going bad, you'll tell people thank you. Number two, be happy. It's a whole lot easier to say thank you when you're happy. When somebody does something for you and you're happy, thank you. Be happy. 
Everybody's excited at Christmas. Everybody's excited at their birthday. They're happy and they get gifts and they're happy and it's easy then to say thank you. Listen, as Christians, the joy of the Lord should be our strength. We should be happy all of the time. If you find yourself getting down and getting discouraged, find something that'll raise your spirits. And I'm not meaning illegal substances either. <laughs> Some people turn to them. They turn to addictive substances. If it's not illegal, it's addictive. Don't turn to those things either. I've got to have this. In order. No, you don't. No, you don't. Learn to turn to the Lord. But you need to learn. Like for me, I know this. I've got to have some good Christian music. There's some times where I can feel like I can feel it. I'm, I'm just, I'm getting cranky. One, a Snickers and a Dr. Pepper will help. But anyway, <laughs> I can find where I'm getting really cranky. And you know what I know I need? I need, I got to listen to some good Christian music. I know, I, I just, I have to have that. It's got to lift my spirit. I can't stay in that spirit of just constantly being negative. I was talking to my wife this past week about this. Well, I was thinking about this and I said, I think sometimes I even smile too much. Maybe I quit smiling, but I do. I try to train myself to be happy. Don't just go through life of everything is bad and it's gonna, it's about to get worse. No, maybe things got bad, but it's gonna get better. That's the attitude we have to have. Be happy. A happy person is gonna be a thankful person. They're gonna be a lot more appreciative of the things that are done for them. And by the way, we can look at all this with Bible verses, um, uh, where Paul is talking about for us to be happy. Be happy. Oh, but let me go on and then joyful. There's one more thing, and this is this is really important. Go back to our text in Acts chapter 27 and verse 25. Have hope. Have hope. You know what you need to be thankful? You need to make it a habit. You need to be happy. And you need to have hope. Notice what Paul says in Acts 27, 25. Here he is in the middle of this storm. Two weeks. They had not seen the sun, the sun nor stars, verse 20 tells us. Two weeks. Paul's been listening to these people cry out to their Roman deities. Two weeks he's been hearing this and seeing this and everybody trying to, uh, 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 you know, survive the storm. Two weeks Paul's watched all of this. But notice what he says in verse 25. He says, Wherefore, sirs, by the way, he says in verse 24, fear not, Paul. He tells that there was an angel that stood by him, and this is what the angel told him, saying, fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Verse 25, here's Paul's hope. He says, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Remember what I was telling you about being happy? Paul made it a habit. Paul was happy, and Paul had hope. He says, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I... Believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Paul had hope. It was going to help us to be thankful is hope. When you lose hope, there's nothing, there's nothing to be thankful for. Somebody does something, why? It's not going to do any good anyway. Just worthless. It's just it's not going to matter at all. We're all going. We're all going to die. We're all going down with the ship. What good's it going to do to eat this bread? We're going to die anyway. When you lose hope, you lose a reason to be thankful. Even if things around us do not seem very hopeful, we still have hope in. Keep your eyes on him. Keep trusting him. God has something for each one of us to do. Or otherwise, he would have already taken us to heaven. That's something for each one of us to do. I don't know what it is. You've got to find that out from the Lord. There's something for each one of us. There's still hope. There's still something. When that sun comes up more, there's still something to live for. That day, there's still something to keep you going. You've got to have hope. This is how we can be thankful. In the storm, and in the shelter. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, please give us hope. Lord, it's so easy to become discouraged and to become careful as we read about, about everything. Lord, please help us just to cast our care upon you. Give us hope. Lord, give us your joy. Give us cheer. Give us uh, 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 happiness. Uh, Lord, just uh, encourage us 
that we can see the good in every situation. We can see good in, in people. Lord, please help us not to lose our smile and our joy. Lord, please help us to make it a habit of being thankful. We thank you for this time of year, Lord, where we're reminded to be thankful. Forgive us, Lord, where we haven't been thankful. Forgive us where we've let sin come into our heart and to rob us of our thankfulness. Please, Lord, help and bless. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. The altar is open. The invitation is yours. You know how the